Let's take our Bibles and go to Jeremiah chapter 12. We want to get back to where we were studying last week after a brief introduction. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 12. I want to remind us of something and see that you remember what we've been studying. Now, did you do your homework? Yes. Praise the Lord. Part of the homework was to read Great Controversy, the chapter Scripture, Our Safeguard. Oh, there's Sister Minnie. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Right on point. All right. Now, we have noticed that 2020 is no ordinary year. Have we found this out? Yes. We have been studying about this before 2020 came, but as we have dug into it, what we have been looking at in prophecy, everybody has found out by occurring events. We knew that 2020 would be no ordinary year, but it has proved to be so. And it means something. Now, we know that in 1844, something happened very significantly. Remember that? In heaven, what happened in 1844? Christ moved somewhere. He went from the holy place into the most holy place. Now, that started a series of events. In Jeremiah, we saw three great time frames. How many time frames? Three. three. What were the three time frames? I'm going to put the paper down in a moment, but I just want to test you to see if you remember. What were the three time frames? Time of the footmen, time of the horses, and the time of the swelling of the Jordan. Where would I find that? Jeremiah. Let's go there. Let's go there. Jeremiah chapter 12. In Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5. Let's read that together. And we want to pick up where we left off last week. Jeremiah 12 and verse 5. We're there, amen? Let's read that together. Father, anoint your words. As we have opened it, we can do nothing without your Holy Spirit. Guide us, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 5, all together, it says, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend how, who? with the horses? And in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they have wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the three time frames are brought to view. First, the time of the footmen. Then the time of the horses. And then the time of the swelling of the Jordan. We know that everything that happened in the Bible, it had its historical application in Jeremiah's day, but it pinpointed a time for the last days. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 30 speaks of the time of Jacob's trouble. We found out that these three time frames are leading us there. The swelling of the Jordan takes us into the time of Jacob's trouble. So what, when did the time of the footmen start in a special sense? 1844. Was that a special date? Yes. Christ moved into the most holy place. How long would the time of the footmen be into existence? From 1844 until when? The National Sunday, the National Sunday Law. And then from the National Sunday Law, it, was, it will move from the time of the footmen and move into the time of the what? Yeah. The horses. Now, are horses faster than foot or foot faster than horses? Horses, horses faster than foot. So if we can't keep up with people on foot, we cannot keep up with the horses. Then it tells us that the horses we're going to find goes from the time of the Sunday law all the way into what time? The universal, universal Sunday law. What happens at universal Sunday law? Then what happens? Michael stands up. Now, when Michael stands up, we found out from the Bible that meant two things. What happens when Michael stands up? What does that mean? The probation closes. But, but why? The two things happen when Michael stands up, which indicates that that happens. Two things happen. Judgment is finished. That a priest, when he judges, he must sit in judgment. When he stands up, the judgment is over. What else? Judgment. What else? Uh -uh. Sitting. When Michael stands up, we're talking about when Michael stands up. Two things happen. It's right here on the board. No judgment, no priest. When Michael stands up, he's no longer operating as a priest. No more intercession. No more working for the salvation of man. So when Michael stands up, because there's no more judgment and no more priest to work for sinful man, it is at that point that probation is closed. But that starts the time of the swelling of the Jordan. That's going to be the greatest time of trouble that the universe has ever seen and will never see again. The only way to go through this time we must know Jesus as a close, 
intimate and personal friend. Do you want to know God like that? Yes. This is why we come to church. We come to church for this experience. Now, 2020 has been an ordinary year. Now, I want us to look at this for a screen. Look what this says. We'll come back to this before we close. But what does that, the Chicago Tribune, the newspaper say? What does it say? Talk to me. What does it say? Can the United States survive what? The 2020. Now, if you look about it, <laughs> from a historical standpoint, it almost looks like it doesn't seem like we can survive it. It has been so confused. The times in which we live have been so strange. We found out that the thinking men have been looking at this time all along. Remember what we read? That they have their attention fixed upon the events that are taking place all about us. They see this. Now, what have the thinking men said? Talk to me. Anybody, anybody remember? What have the thinking men, the historical men, the economists, the, the businessmen, what, those who really understand the events, what have they told us, many of these experts? That our system of living cannot continue without a collapse in the sequence we're moving. All of them have said that. We've looked here in this, in, in, in this church and we've looked at some of those articles where all this is taking place. Now, we're going to find that just like this, the thinking men, no matter what field, I don't care what field you turn to. They said that a crisis would begin happening in 2020 and that it would be developing, increasing, 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 increasing. And they say possibly... We might make it and see it to 2030 and this type of thing before some great upheaval takes place. This is what they said. In fact, look at one historian. Let's look at one historian. Now, remember, what did the prophet say? What type of man? What type of man? Amen. Now, look at the article. What is the article? What, what is the, 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 the place called? Big what? Here's where the thinkers are. Now, watch what the prophet said. Exact word. Now, watch what the prophet says. She told us this. Now, watch what the historian says. Why the fall of the American empire will come by what? Now, his, this is a historian. He's not a, 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 a minister of prophecy. This is a historian named Alfred McCoy. He explains the, why the American power is coming to an end, and he lays down what he thinks is going to happen. Now, this man doesn't understand the Bible. He doesn't understand the prophecies that God has given us, but he can look at history and the events and recognize something that's happening. Now, watch what he says. Now, it says, the historian writes that all negative trends that are what? Plaguing America now. So the trouble didn't just start then. Now, notice the year. What year is this? Now, this is 2017. We've been talking about this for many years. But in 2017, he, he writes this article. It says, now watch what he says in 2017. The historian writes that all negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by what? 2020. What's he right? Yes or no? Yes. yes. It says, and would reach a critical mass no later than what? So he says, look, between 2020 and 2030, history, history says that America is going to face some serious troubles. Then it says, the American century proclaimed so triumphantly at the start of World War II may already be tattered and fading by what? So it's, it's, he's not even saying that we'll reach 2030. But he's saying America is getting worse and worse. From 2020 forward, we're going to see more and more problems. Now he wrote this in 2017. Is it happening? Yes. It is. The prophet told us that the thinking men would see this. Did the prophet tell us this, yes or no? Yes. The thinking men would see this. Here's another thinking man. That was Alfred McCoy. Here's another one. This man's name is uh, 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 Samuel Huntington. American history is driven by periodic moments of moral convulsion. The late Harvard political scientist. He's not a historian now. This man is a what? Now, do you know what a political scientist is? Anybody know what a political scientist is? What is a political science, science, scientist? He studies with chemistry. He's looking at the chemicals. That's what he does. <laughs> he studies the social fabric of this country, how the nations and the people in society relate to each other, and what are the outcomes, whether good or bad, what are the outcomes based on certain things that are done. In other words, if a person does this, this is normally what happens in society. If a person does this, this is normally what happens in society, but particularly the political life of society. The government, the way that the government is run. Now, notice what this man said from Harvard. Harvard, is that some little peon school in the world or is that considered a great school in the world? The late Harvard political scientist signed Samuel P. Huntington noticed that these convulsions in history, particularly American history, seem to hit the United States what? Every 60 years. So as he studied the political science, he's noticed every 60 or so years, something happens in America from the time it, it, it was founded. Now, if you go back, 
He will tell you about a crisis that started way back in the 1760s. And you'll find it. You'll find it. Find it. Historically so. If you keep going, you'll find that by the 1820s, 60 years later, another crisis took place in America. And if you keep following that down, you'll find another crisis in the 1890s. Eventually, you'll come to the 1960s. Was 1960s times of peace or were they turbulent times? They were turbulent times. Now, I want to ask you a question. If all of these from America stand starting, the political scientist has noticed between every 60 or so years, something happens. If in 1960 was the last great upheaval, 60 years later, we should expect another one. If you are a political scientist watching these rhythms. Now, if I go from 1960 and I add 60 years to that, what do I get? 20. 20. So the political scientists have walked through and actually seen that this has exactly happened rhythmatically. Now, this is not just one man, another, the man from Harvard. You can go all the way through and men after men have come up and begin to start saying the same thing. Now, he says the events of 2020, what are some of the events? The coronavirus what? Pandemic. The killing of what? George Floyd. The militias, the social media, urban unrest were like hurricanes that hit the middle of that earthquake. In other words, even if none of these things happened, 2020 would have been a terrible time. If there was no pandemic, if there had been no killing of the police of this uh, unarmed black man, if there had been no uprest and unrest, if there had been no social media mobs, if there had been no election in 2020, if none of those things were happening, 2020 would have still been a turbulent time. So all of this is compounding problems on top of problems, trouble on top of trouble. Now, at the, in the midst of that, it says they did not cause the moral convulsion. In other words, these things that we see, the pandemic and all this, it didn't cause the problems in America. It just exposed the problems that already existed. It says they flooded the ravines that opened up in American society and exposed every flaw. Now, as we enter the final month of the election, this period of convulsion careens toward its what? They're saying that the elections in 2020 is the climax of this climatic year of 2020. And he's right. Donald Trump is in the process of shredding every norm of decent behavior and wrecking every institution he touches, unable to behave responsibly, unable to protect himself from COVID-19. It goes through these different lists. It says this essay is an account of convulsions that brought us to what? This fatal moment. Now, it says it uses religion to, to, to bring out a point. Watch what they say. When people in the church lose faith or trust in God, what happens to the church? So what would happen in a political arena if people were to lose faith in the government? The government of America would collapse. This is what the political scientists recognize, that America is heading toward a collapse. Now, if it collapses, you know what you call that? A revolution. It's overturned. Now, inspiration tells us that this will take place. Inspiration tells us we will see a civil war right when it's happening. Now, in the midst of all this, are we in trouble, yes or no? Yes. Now, what did God want to help the world in the condition we're in right now? Who did God want to help the world? God set up the Seventh Adventist Church. Seventh Adventist Church was supposed to be injecting the world with solutions to all of its problems. Its political problems, its economic problems, its social problems, all these problems, God gave the solution to the Seventh Adventist Church in the Bible. But guess where we are? Guess what's happening to us? This, this, this is the condition of the Seventh Adventist Church right now. Now, you may not see that. Look, look carefully. You know, you know what this is right here, what this represents? A church. You see what this is right here? The minister. You know what he's doing? Praying. You're the people looking on, the members of the church looking on. And you know what this is right here? Life support. When does a man put on life support? He's in perfect health. Is that right? Uh, Brother Bill, if a man was in perfect health and said to you, I want to put you on, you, I want to put you on life support. What do you tell the man? <laughs> I don't need it. <laughs> don't give me life support right now. <laughs> that, that, that would make me sick. So now here the church is on life support. Now, what does that tell us about the condition of the church? Dying. That the church is almost dead. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is what gets me in trouble. I'm, I'm, I just got to be honest with you. This will get me in trouble for me to be to give you the honest condition of our church by giving honest condition of the church so, you know if you go to if you go to a doctor physician right. you you think that you might have some type of growth on your body and foot leg or somewhere else you think it might be what do you think sometimes it might be what yes. cancerous yes. you go to the physician do you want the physician to tell you 
you are getting ready to die in two days. Do you want the physician to tell you that? <laughs> you don't want that. That most people don't go to the doctor or to the physician. Many of them, you know why? Because they don't want to hear what's really happening. But now, when you come to God and to the minister, the minister shouldn't tell you what you want to hear. The minister should tell you what our true condition is. Am I right or wrong? All right. Now, do you want to know the true diagnosis or you want me to keep lying to you, put you to sleep? You want the true diagnosis? You want a true diagnosis? Christian service 42. Let's read it together. It says, a, what's the first word? Revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of what? To seek this should be our... So what's the first thing we should be doing as a church? Trying to win the community. Is that right? The first work that we should do as a church before we can reach the community properly and solve its problems, we've got to look at ourselves and say, look, we have just as much problems and more than the world right now. Let's get right with God so we can be in a position to help somebody else. First, take the beam out of your own eye, revival, reform. Then we can go into the churches in the world and take the mode out of their eye. Am I right or wrong? Right. It says the time has come, not just for a revival, but the time has come, number two, for a what? Thorough, Thorough reformation to take place. The time has come for a what? Thorough reformation to take place. Now, if I put these two things together, what, do, what is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs? Talk to me. A revival and a reformation. Now, I want to ask you a question. What does revival suggest? What is a revival? What is that? Waking up. Revive. Vive comes from the word vitamin, vitality. When your person checks the vital signs, that means that they're checking for signs that they are alive. So a revival is something that will bring somebody back to life. Now, if a person is already alive, do they need revival? Yes or no? You only need revival if you're dying. You don't need revival for your life. You, you need to stay alive, maintain that life, but you don't need revival. It says the time has come for a thorough, what's the next word? Reformation. So then I want to ask you a question. If the church, if its greatest need, if the greatest need of the church, most urgent, greatest of all her needs is a revival, then what does that tell me about the church? She has to be dead. She has to be dying. If she's not dead or dying, she does not need a revival. revival. This is what the prophet meant when the prophet says in Christian service, a revival and reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are what? They're not the same thing. It says revival signifies a what? Renewal of spiritual life. A quickening of powers of mind and heart. A resurrection from spiritual what? So where is the condition of the church, uh, the church if she needs a revival? She is what? Spiritually, we are dead. Reformation, though, is something else. Reformation, when a person comes back to life, signifies a what? Reorganization. And one word, what would you call reformation? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Here's a man. He's been eating pork chops all his life. He gets to 50 years old. And his arteries are clogged from all the fat, from all the calories, from all the grease. He goes to the doctor and the doctor says, son, you can't live like that. I've got to do a triple bypass upon you. Opens up your arteries. Puts a stent inside you. You know what you've just been given? That man should have died, am I right? That's right. But that physician has just given him another lease on life. You know what he's really just done? He's just given him a physical revival. But it's over now. He can do whatever he wants. Is that right? No. What if that man continues to eat pork chops? He's going to be right back in the same condition, but now worse because he's already had a triple bypass. So when I'm revived, revival is necessary or else nothing else you do will matter. What if you <laughs> think about this now? When that man gets back off of the pork chops, and he gets a new lease on life. What should he start doing now? He should start making some what? Changes. He said, you know what I used to do? Guess what? I can't do anymore. What I used to do, I can't do anymore. It's more serious. I can't do that anymore. Now, my brothers and my sisters, that's the same thing that happens. That's when you look at the church, when the church recognizes this condition. 
at least the first sign I need to wake up. You know, see, it makes no good to, to, to change if you're dead. If we're dead, imagine here's a man, he's dead. And he's been eating pork chops. And you take the pork chops off his plate, but he's dead. What did it do for him? He's dead. It's too late. So to try to make changes in your life while you're spiritually dead, that's nothing. It means nothing. That's what the Pharisees did. They made changes, but they had no spiritual life. They were as dead inside. They were white and sepulchers, but inside they had dead men's bones. They were dead. The first step is not change. You know what the first step is? Come to Jesus that we might have what? Life. Who gives us life? Jesus said over the grave of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 12 says that. But now and then, once we come back to life, you know the next step is? There has to be some what? Reformation. Reformation. Change in what? In other words, the way I think on that has to change. Do you know that when we start reforming, the way we think about worship has to change. The way we think about diet has to change. The way we think about dress has to change. The way we think about education and the way we use our money and our time, our relationships, everything in life, our thoughts of them have to change. There has to be a change in ideas and theories, habits, and what else? Will it be practical, yes or no? Yes. It says reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the what? In other words, it makes no sense to change if we don't first come to Jesus to get life. Then it says revival and reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this work, they must... Blend. What does blend mean? So what if somebody says, well, I want to come to Jesus to get life, but I don't want to change. Is that blending? No. What if somebody says, I want to change, but I want to remain dead. I don't want to have the life in Christ. Is that blending? No. We need both. Now, my brothers and sisters, you know what God needs because if the church, look at the eyes. I mean, can you see the eyes? Yes. Look at the, look, look at the, the, the sheet almost making like the mouth is almost gone. No. Now, I want to ask you a question. What needs to happen to this church? Now watch. Are you watching? Look what it says. What needs to happen to this church? CPR. Somebody needs to resuscitate it. See, the seven in this church, the reason why people don't fully understand when they, when they see the church is dying, some people leave the church, some people do everything else, blame the church, call it babbling, just, just mess the church up, or some people want to ignore it. We're dead, but let's pretend like we're alive. You, you, we only have a few more, at least give them a few more months to, 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 to look like they're alive and then just die. That's not good. But then there comes another class who recognize the church is dying, but guess what? There's hope in a revival and reformation through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is why we should come to church, to get this experience and then ourselves, not to condemn the church, but then with that life that Jesus gives us, to say, how can we go to someone else? and begin to start inspiring life and change through Jesus Christ. I'm talking about CPR. Now, to become a doctor, it may take you many years. Am I right? But to learn CPR, it doesn't take you years. You know how fast you can learn CPR? You can have a day class and learn CPR. You can have a weekend class and learn CPR. You can learn in a little while what it takes to resuscitate a church. Every one of us can. And you don't have to be a doctor. In fact, you, when you take a CPR class, you know they don't come to you and say, uh, do you have your PhD? Well, you can't take this class. They don't do that. I mean, in fact, if you look, guess what? Even a child, children can learn, guess what? CPR. A child can, can be taught how to do CPR. Do you know that God can use a child or an adult to begin resuscitating a church? But something has to happen. Watch what the prophet says. I'm not talking about CPR. You know what I'm talking about? CPR. Let's read it now. Let's read it together. Last day of Vince 2 or 4, it says, We are made what? Sad. As we see in many places so much left, what? Undone that should be done. Are there things that should be happening right now in Richland? Yes or no? Yes. But the Lord will use in the accomplishment of his work means that we do not now what? Now, you don't even see what God's going to use to, to, to bring Richlands back to his right position. Let me tell you what he's looking at. He's looking at all the smoky. He says, this is the man I'm going to use. He's looking at Brother Bill. He said, Brother Bill. Yes, he's looking at Brother Bill. <laughs> he said, look, Brother Bill, you coming Sabbath by Sabbath? You know what he's saying? I'm getting ready to use you to do a great work. It's amazing. I remember the first time my teacher, 
when I opened up my eyes to see this message and I started seeing this message and I said, teacher, I've never heard anything like this before. You got to come back to, to, to Florida where I, where I am and, and, and teach some people this. You know what he said? He said, I'm not going to come. You going to teach it. And I said, no, I know where I can teach this. <laughs> no way in the world that I can understand what you've been talking about. He said, yes, you will. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. Amen. It's not by might. It's not by our power. It's by God's what? Every one of us can become a committee of one to do this. He's getting ready to use you, Brother Bill. Sister Teresa, you didn't come here by accident. You didn't just make a move. God brought you here. Amen. I look at Brother Tim. God, God has a special work for you, Brother Tim. That's right. The same with you. You've been here a, 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 a long time in this church. God says, look, you're not here for no accident. All of us, Sister Minnie, all of us are here for such a time as. Now watch. It says. These are the means. We don't see it now. We look at ourselves. How is God going to do this? But you don't see what God sees. It says he will raise up from among only the ones who have PhDs. Is that what it said? No. He will raise up from among what? No. The common people. That's the person who has no training, no clergy, religious, special training. He's trained by God himself. It says he will raise up among the common people, men and women, to do his work, even as of old he called what? Fishermen to be his disciples. People who are considered unlearned. Somebody said, oh, you don't know how to talk. You don't know how to walk. You don't know the culture. You don't know how to read. You don't know how to do this. God said, look, I'm going to use that man. Amen. Because he'll be willing to trust me. It says, there will soon be an awakening that will what? Surprise. Now give me another name for this awakening. Revival. It says, those who do not realize the necessity of what is to be done will be what? pass by. So that means that in this church we got to understand what should we be doing right now. We've got to understand what needs to be done. We've got to understand how to finish this work. It says, and the heavenly messengers will work with those who are called the what everybody? Common people fitting them to carry the truth to where? Many places. Now is the time for us to awake and do what we can. Now I'm going to tell you something. Some people think that that's going to start by us going to other countries and going around the world to other cities before this work. The work, the work don't start in other countries. The work starts right here. We're going to find out that right in this church, God's not going to be able to just grab the whole denomination. But guess what he's going to do? He's going to start with an individual and he's going to start with a family. You remember what Joshua said? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You've got to make that commitment as a husband, as fathers, as men, as wives, as mothers, as women, as children, as young people. We have to make the decision, Lord, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to make a decision. Whatever changes that need to happen, whatever life, I'm going to go to Jesus. Do you know that Jesus loves you? Amen. I was talking to God this morning. I'm just saying, Lord, this is so serious. There's so much that we need to get into. And God said, make sure you tell them how much I care about them. God loves you. God loves me. Does God love you? Yes. What is one of the greatest evidences that God, God loves you? He gave his son. He didn't just loan him to us. He gave him to us forever. Yes. That no matter how many mistakes we've made, do you know that every one of us can get things right with God? All of our families can be right with God. Nothing should distract us and divert us from what needs to happen right now. Amen? Amen. We need to say, Lord, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, we're going to pause right here. Before we go deeper into our study, I think we need to pray one more time and ask, Lord, as we get deep into the study this morning, we have some ground to cover. Are you ready to study? Amen. Before we do, would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, in 2020, we're at the beginning of a great crisis and the world doesn't fully understand it. They know that something great and decisive is about to take place, but they don't fully understand what it is. Only the Bible gives a correct and accurate description of what's about to take place in this world as an overwhelming surprise. And we have reached the beginning of the end of all things. And so, Father, as we study this morning, open up our eyes, open up our ears, show us how much you love us, show us that we must be brought back to life. 
that we've got to pray and study like we've never prayed and studied before, that the time of the horses is about to start. And Lord, we're getting tired now. How can we run with the horses if right now we're not spending time with you? Please help us, dear God. Hold up the time as we study that we may understand where we are, what's happening, and what we need to be doing so that not only can we get ready, but that you can use us to reach the world and finish the work before it is everlasting too late. So please abide with us now on this Sabbath morning, we pray. For we ask all of this, and Lord, I can't do it. I need your wisdom. I need your spirit and all of us, Lord, to understand we need the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into all truth. So grant it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we want to try to pick back up where we left off. So we want to back up just a little bit. Jump back into where we left off so that we can all be together. Let's go to Daniel. Back in Daniel. You're in Jeremiah now. Go over a couple books to Daniel, the 12th chapter. And as we have studied, we have found something out. That we are this morning on the threshold of great and solemn events. Now, when a person comes to a threshold of a door, of a house, and they come to a threshold of a building, is the threshold mean that they're far from entering something, or does it mean they're right at the, uh, right at the place, right, right close to entering in? We are today on the threshold of great and solemn events. Everything that God has told us to transpire is happening right now. And the world does not understand what this means. They, they, they see something, but they don't understand what's coming. Something is about to break upon us as an overwhelming surprise. In fact, inspiration says that something is coming to this continent, to this country. Not just to this country, but to the entire world more serious and severe than anything we've ever witnessed. And you know what God knows? He knows we're not ready. Inspiration says there's going to be a time of trouble such as what? Never was. In fact, in the book of Daniel chapter 12, let's look at that. And Daniel 12. Now remember, we're going to go through these verses several times to come back to really understand it. But Daniel 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1. Are you there? Amen? amen. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of what? We know that this Michael is Jesus. And when Jesus stands up, the Bible says, and there shall be a time, not of peace. That's not what it says. Not a time of prosperity. That's not what it says. It says a time of what? Trouble. trouble. What type of trouble? Such as? Never was. Do you think we're ready for this? No. We are not. And Satan knows it. In fact, watch what the prophet says concerning this time. Look what it says. I saw, this is early writings, 119. The prophet says, I saw that the, talk to me remnant were not prepared. Now, it's not talking about Babylon, not the Sunday church, it's not the world. It says, I saw that the remnant, who's that? Talk to me, who's that? That's us, that's seven heaven, that's us. It says, I saw that the remnant were not prepared for what is, what does that tell me? Something is coming upon the earth. Stupidity like lethargy seemed to hang upon the minds of most of those who profess to believe that we are having, what everybody, the it says, it is hanging upon the minds, not of a few, but upon the minds of what? Wow. That's amazing. When a minister says that most of the people are not ready, you know what someone says? He's being fanatical. He's being extreme. He's making something up. But, 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 but when God says it, you can't say to God, you're being extreme. You've got to say, God, I see the diagnosis. I'm in trouble. Are you with me? Before today is over with, we're going to show you again that 99%, how much did I say? That 99% of the church today, unready. We're going to see that 99% will not go through the crisis when the Sunday lunch pass. We're going to find that less than 1% of seven Adventists today will be ready for that crisis. Now, that's a startling statement I just made. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. Sometimes the person here, oh, he's making it up. But we should be able to go back to the Bible. We should be able to go to the spirit of prophecy and prove everything we believe. This is why this class, I'm talking about why, what? B-T-I. This is why this class, what does BTI stand for? Bible Training Institute. Every church should be a school. Every church should be able to tell the members, don't believe it because the church said it, or a minister said it, or a man said it. You can't put your trust in a man. Did you read your homework, yes or no? In the chapter of Scripture, I save God, it says the way the devil controls the church is by making them put their trust where? Is it, does it say that, yes or no? I didn't make that up. God said that. By putting our trust in men whether he be a minister or a pastor or a professor or a teacher 
or a parent. It doesn't matter who it is. As long as that person is not in harmony with the word of God, they can deceive us. Am I right or wrong? Yes. Jesus said, beware of false prophets. He said, that, 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 let, uh, leave the, uh, the, uh, the leaders of blind leaders alone. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. I don't want to be in a ditch. No. Now listen, we'll come back. We'll come back before it's over and prove that. Now this says, most of those who profess to believe the message are not ready. My company angel cried out with awful solemnity, what? Yes. Get ready. What else? Yes. Get ready. What else? Yes. Why would the prophet need to repeat that, th those, th those two words three times? Why? <laughs> Evidently, we're not ready. Right. It says, for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. His wrath is to be poured out unmixed with mercy, and ye are not, what? Ready. Rend your heart and not your garment. What must take place? Talk to me, somebody. A great work must be done, not for the world. Yes, that's true, but it says a great work must be done for what? The remnant. That's us. My brothers and sisters, if we really understood what was coming, we would recognize this trouble is right upon us. Now, question. If Michael stands up, is everything just beginning or is it finishing? It's finishing. It's finishing. Now, I want you to see something. In Daniel 12, 1, God has a plan. Now, this says God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to do what? To prepare a people not to sit, but to prepare people to what? Now, what I want to do for a moment, I want to go back to the Bible and I want to show us that it has been God's plan from the beginning of time all the way to the end of time to prepare a people to stand. In fact, in Daniel 12, 1, it says that Michael is going to do what? Stand. Now, God's plan is different from Satan's plan. Satan has a plot, but God has a plan. Satan's plot is that every member of the Seventh Adventist Church will not be prepared to stand when Michael stands up. But God has a different plan. You know what God's plan is? God's plan is that he's going to bring his people to a place that when Michael stands up, his people will be prepared to stand with him when he stands. I want to stand with God. What do you say? Amen. Now go to Revelation. What book did I say? Then you were in Daniel. Go over to Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Go to Revelation chapter 6. And what we're going to see, that ever since man fell, you're going to Revelation 6, that ever since man fell at the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, when he fell into sin, ever since that time, God's purpose has been to prepare a people to do what, everybody? To what? Stand. Now, this is God's purpose in giving the Bible. This is God's purpose in the plan of redemption. This is God's purpose in the sanctuary. This is God's purpose in the everlasting gospel. This is God's purpose in the three angels' messages. This is God's purpose of why he rose up the seven of his church. This is the purpose of God to repair people to stand. Not because I say so, but because God says so. Look what it says. Let's read it one more time. It says in 1 Manuscript 2.28, it says God's purpose. Not man's purpose, but what? God's purpose. In giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him when? During the investigative judgment. So we have to find out what does it mean to be prepared to what? Stand. We've got to find out what does that mean? Can I live just like I please and still be prepared to stand? So we've got to go back to the Bible and understand this. It says this is the purpose for which we establish, start, and maintain, keep it going, our what, everybody? Publishing houses. What else? Our schools. What else? Our sanitariums. What else? Our hygienic restaurants. What else? Our treatment rooms. What else? Our Now listen, do you know it's possible today in 2020? Our schools were established for one purpose, to prepare people to what? True to him when? During the investigative judgment. Now, it's possible to go to our schools that were established for this purpose from kindergarten all the way and get your Ph.D. in our school system and never once hear of the investigative judgment. It's possible. And I don't say this in the kind of way, but I tell you the truth. It's possible. It's possible to go to our school system and never once hear in a good light of the sanctuary, of his cleansing, of the worker, Sister White of the three angels' messages, of these various things. Now, we've got to understand, if God prepared us for this, how could we go to school and not learn about the investigative judgment? It's because the devil does not want somebody to be prepared to stand. And if you were the devil, what would you do? If you cannot beat them from the outside, you know what you must do? You must join them from the 
inside. It's called infiltration. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, this is the purpose why we're establishing and maintaining our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums. Now, if our schools stop teaching this, what is the purpose of their existence? There's no purpose. It says, this is our purpose in carrying forward how much? Every line of work in the cause. Why do we have a church to prepare a people to what? If our church is not doing that, there's no reason for the existence of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. But my brothers and sisters, today we don't even understand what it means to stand. It says we must be prepared to stand, not at any time. It says during. That's the time frame. During what? Talk to me. During the what? During the in investigative what so then what would we have to study in order to know how to prepare someone for the investigative judgment we would have to study the investigative judgment what did we have we've been studying the investigative judgment yes or no yes this is why this is our purpose we got to understand what it is now I'm going to ask us a question does the Bible tell us what the prophet says because everything the prophet says guess what the Bible says and everything this Bible says guess what the prophet says and if you believe that then you're almost a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, the more we study that, the more you understand it. And look at Revelation 6, and let's go in the Bible and see that. In Revelation, the sixth chapter, we want to pick up in verse 14. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. amen. All right, you're there. Revelation 6. Elder, would you read that for us? Beginning in verse 14. Revelation 6 and verse 14. What does it say in verse 14, please? Now, I want to back you up, excuse me. I want to back you up to verse 12. Back up to verse 12, please. And I beheld when, the, when he opened the sixth seal. Now, what seal is he opening in Revelation 6, verse 12? What seal? The six. six seal. Now, if you study Revelation, how many seals are in this book that he's opening? Seven. 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 Now, is seven a special number? Seven. We've been studying this and we found out the entire Bible is built on the number seven. seven. The sanctuary is built on the number seven. The plan of redemption is built on the number seven. Time itself is built on the number seven. It's not accidental that we're called Seventh Day Adventists. It's the religion of the Bible. See, all Seventh Day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. I want this to be etched into our brain. Somebody says, you're Seventh Day Adventist. What? Why do you argue that? Because Seventh Day Adventism is the religion of the Bible. And if a man believed the Bible, eventually he would become a seven Adventist if he were sincere and honest. Now, my brothers and sisters, there are only seven seals. Now, if I come to the sixth seal, do you think I'm dealing with something at the beginning of time, the middle of time, or the end of time? Yeah. Now, think about it. How many days in a week? Seven. seven. If I come to the sixth day of the week, what day is the sixth day of the week? Friday. Friday. If I come to the sixth day of the week, am I dealing with something at the beginning of the week, the middle of the week, or the end of the week? End, end of the week. So if I come to the sixth seal, I've got to be dealing with something not at the beginning of time, not at the middle of time, but something at the... Yeah. Now, at the end of time, notice what happens. Jump down to verse 14 again, my brother. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Mm -hmm. And every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Fifteen. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains... It looked like everybody. <laughs> What did they do? Where? Now notice what they were saying. Let's all pick up in verse 16. Verse 16 says, And said to the mountains and rocks, What? Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the... Now notice why. Verse 17. Let's read that together. For the great day of his wrath is come. Now notice the question. And who shall be able to stand. So what was the question that was concerning John in the last days under the sixth seal? The question was what? Who shall be able to stand? This has been God's plan from Genesis all the way when man fell to the book of Revelation to prepare somebody that can stand true to God during the investigative judgment so that when Michael stands up, somebody can stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, without sinning, to vindicate the character of God before the entire universe. This is going to prove that God is right and Satan is wrong. Every knee will bow. This is what Satan does not want to see. Because when this takes place, the day of atonement can come to an end. Now, in order to understand that, we've got to study deeply, earnestly. And so we're going to go back to this. But we can see in the Bible, the question is, who shall be able to what? Stand. 
So what do we need to answer from the Bible? How do I stand? What does it mean to stand? In other words, the question is, what religious experience must I have if I'm going to be prepared to stand? Go to the book of Hosea. What book did I say? Hosea. Now, after the book of Daniel, back in the Old Testament, after the book of Daniel, you come to the book of Hosea. Go to Daniel and then go to Hosea. And we want to go to Hosea 14, Hosea chapter 14. And the question we're trying to get answered from the Bible is how will we be prepared to stand? What Christian experience, what religious experience must be mine if I'm going to be prepared to stand? Hosea chapter 14. And I'm going to ask if Amaya will read this for us loud and clear. Hosea 14, beginning in verse 1. First, I'm going to ask this question. What would cause a man to fall? Can you fall and stand at the same time? A man that's falling, he's not standing. When man fell, it, it's not called the uh, standing of man, it's called the what? Fall of man. Now let's see what caused a man to fall. Because whatever caused a man to fall would prevent him from standing. Look at Hosea 14, beginning in verse 1. Uh, Amaya, would you read that for us, please? Yes. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. Why? question. What caused a man to fall? Talk to me. The Bible says iniquity. What is another word? What is another word for iniquity? Sin. Sin. So what caused a man to fall? Talk to me. Sin. Sin. So my brother and sister, that's why when Adam and Eve sin, it's not called the standing of man. When Adam and Eve sin, it's called the fall of man because sin makes a man fall. It will never make a man stand. In fact, look at the verse 9. What book did I say? Uh, what verse? Verse 9. Would you pick up in verse 9? Would you read that for Sister Minnie, loud and clear? Hosea 14 and verse 9. What does verse 9 say? Who is wise, and he shall understand these things? Prudence, and he shall know. Now watch what the wise will know. Continue. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk. Now the just, they shall not fall, they shall what? Walk, walk in them. But now watch this. Continue. Let me stop you for a moment. But the transgressor. The what, everybody? The transgressor, continue my sister, shall what? Shall fall. So the Bible tells me who is going to fall is the what? Talk to me. The transgressor. So that tells me that transgression causes a man not to stand, it causes a man to fall. Well, how would I know what transgression is? The Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. 1 John 3, 4. So when a man sins, he transgresses the law, and instead of standing, he's made to what? Fall. Fall. I'm going to say it again. Transgression causes a man to sin. And when a man sins, he can't stand, it makes him what? Fall. So if I'm going to prepare a people to stand, what must happen to a man to prepare him to stand? Somebody talk to me. If I'm going to prepare somebody to stand, what must happen to a man? He must be able to do something with his sin. He must get something over sin. He must get, I'm going to write it on the board. What must he get? He must get what? Victory over sin. Now, let me tell you something. Modern theology teaches that this is impossible. Modern scholarship teaches it's impossible. Now, this may be shocking to you, but 90% of the church today teaches that man can't get victory over sin. This is where it's taught. I'm not talking about something I made up. I'm talking about sitting down in class, listening to professors, listening to the, the theology leaders and teachers of this denomination telling us from long standing, it is not their fault. They have been taught this year after year. In fact, this came into our church long before any one of us were ever born. And we've got to go back to the Bible and see, did God tell us that this would take place? He warned us of this. But my brothers and sisters, why would the devil do this? He does not want anybody to be prepared to what everybody stand. He understands that you cannot sin and stand at the same time. That something is going to cause the fall. We'll come back to this. We cannot sin and stand at the same time. Now, let me put that up. It says it is too late in the day to feed with what? I'm not giving you milk. I'm trying to give you some strong meat. Now, we found out what it means. Now, listen, somebody has to be prepared to stand by the passing of what? Talk to me. The National Sunday Law. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is it possible 
to live victoriously over every sin. Yes or no? Yes. Does the Bible say so? Yes. Go in your Bible to 1 John. What book did I say? Fact, fact, for, before 1 John, let's go to 1 Peter. Before 1 John, let's go to 1 Peter. Then we'll come to 1 John. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, I want you to watch this now. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I want you to see this. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, once you get there, hold your thumb there. We'll read in just a moment. I want you to turn to the screen after you get to 1 Peter 2. And I want you to notice what the screen says. This is early writing 71, and watch what the prophet says. Let's read it together. It says, I also what? saw that many do not realize what they must teach, what they must preach, what they must, one is what we say, the other is who we are. It says, I saw that many, we're going to find out that's over 99%, do not realize what they must be in order to live, not die, but in order to what? Live in the sight of the Lord when? without a high priest where in the sanctuary now i want to ask you a question why don't they know what they must be to live without a priest without a high priest why don't they, why don't they not know that how come the majority of our church and the world don't know this because they do not know about the sanctuary system many now look at this it says in the sight of the lord without a high priest where in the thy will god is in the that's what the bible says in psalm 77 13. So that tells me then the devil would have to attack the sanctuary message, the plan of redemption, the Bible truth on this. So by not understanding the sanctuary, you would not understand what the congregation must be to live without a what? Without a high priest. It says through the time of trouble, through the time of what? Not a time of peace. It's one thing to live this way during the time of peace, but to live like this during the time of trouble? Now watch what the prophet said, what we must be. Let's read it. Those who receive the now stop I'm, I'm gonna test you see if I need to go to another scripture before first Peter I'm gonna test you why does the prophet automatically start talking about the seal after talking about the time of trouble and the priest and the sanctuary and what we must be why is the, why, why does the prophet all of a sudden start talking about the seal so we receive the seal just before the time of trouble that's exactly right now, in the Bible, I want to, sh I want to show you something. We, we got to look at another text. Go to, go, go to Revelation 7, then we'll come to 1 Peter. Go to Revelation chapter 7. Now, I, I want everybody to be able to see this. So I don't want to just speculate. I want us to speculate. I want us to see it from the Bible. Go to Revelation chapter 6, and then we want to see chapter 7. We'll go to the end of 6, beginning of 7. Now, in Revelation 6, you remember the last question we read in the last verse. What was the issue in the book of Revelation? What's the final issue? Who shall be able to what? Now, did I say that or did the Bible say that? So you can stand. No, no, don't go out here now. Somebody says, well, what were you learning? Well, Brother Davis told me. No, 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 no. You go out here saying the Bible says. So we want to understand what the Bible says. Now, when we talk about being prepared to stand, this is not something I made up. This is the Bible teaching from Genesis to Revelation. So in Revelation chapter 6, the question is, in verse 17, last question, it says in Revelation 6, 17, let's read it together. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to? Stand. So it asks the question, who shall be able to stand? And guess what? The answer is given in chapter 7. So who are those that are going to be prepared to stand? Look at Revelation 7. Revelation 7 verse 1. Look at verse 1. This is the answer. God showed John the answer. He said, look, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to show you. In Revelation 7 verse 1, it says, And after these things I, what's the next word? Saw. saw. What did he see? Four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on what else? In other words, the prophet was seeing a symbolic vision, trouble getting ready to burst upon the world. And he's holding this trouble back until somebody is prepared to stand. Verse 2 says, And I saw another angel ascending from, not the west, but from the what? East. Now, what did that angel have? Having the... Ah, that's the word we're looking for. Having the seal of the living God. Now notice, now remember, in early writing 71, it talks about what we don't know, we, what we must be without a high priest in the sanctuary. Then it says those who receive the seal. We're trying to understand now what the seal is really saying. In Revelation chapter 6, question, who shall be able to stand? You cannot sin and stand at the same time. Hosea told us that. 
We see now in chapter 7 showing a people that are going to stand. But in order to get those people to stand, first, God must hold back time and destruction and trouble. He then sends another angel with a seal from the east, having the seal of the living God. And notice what he does in verse 2, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels and to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. In other words, and to whom was given the cause to, to allow trouble to take place. And then verse 3, let's read that all together. Verse 3, what does it say? Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the tree, see, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God. Where? So the question is, who shall be prepared to stand? Now give me the answer. Who's going to be prepared to stand? Those who receive the seal of the living God. Are we together? Yes or no? So what does that tell me then? In order to be sealed, I must have a particular experience. If only those who are sealed will stand and sin makes me fall, what does that tell me must happen in order for me to get the seal? I've got to have what? Victory over sin by the power of the indwelling Christ. Now look, it says, those who receive the what? Seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble can live as they please. That's not early writings. That's not the prophet and that's not the Bible. That's fairy tale. But I'm going to tell you something. That is the new theology that is sweeping through our churches. They call it grace, but it's not grace. It's cheap. It's not agape. It's sloppy. There's a difference. It says... Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus once in a while. In other words, those who wear the seal must look just like Jesus. That's the goal. Now, who would fight you for telling you that this is the purpose of the Seventh Adventist Church? To make us look just like Jesus. Why would you fight somebody? Isn't that what Christianity is? Someone who is like Christ? But the problem is, most people don't understand really what Jesus was like. We say we talk about him, but we don't understand what he was like. Let's go to 1 Peter and find out what Jesus was like. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now watch now. If we're going to stand, we must have the seal. And that's what Revelation 6 and 7 tell us. If we're going to have the seal, we must reflect the image of Jesus. How? How? Fully. That means that every thought we think, the thought that Jesus would think, every word we say, every action, everything we do, no matter how much we're pressed, no matter how much circumstances are against us, in the home, at the school, at the, the job, the workplace, in society, somebody presses you and steps on your toe. You know what you want to do? Step back. Somebody cuts you off in the road and all of a sudden you're looking for some hands to pick up. And you no, 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 no. That's not the way we talk. You know how many people road rage is killing? Person just the other day got upset. Somebody cut them off. They follow behind him. Hot pursuit. Follow behind the man. Soon they stop. One man put out a gun. And you see what I have? He brandished his gun. Other man's brandished. He took his gun out and shot him dead. Do you think that this is what God wants in society right now? But my brothers and my sisters, this is the evidence of someone who is not like Christ. And though we may not take a gun and shoot somebody, it's amazing sometimes what we'll do with our words and with our thoughts. I don't care how much a man cuts you down. You still must be like Jesus. I don't care who the man is. I don't care, man, oh, I don't care what you do. You, you're not doing right. It's all right. We have to be like Jesus. Now, my brothers and my sisters, that tells me I want to know what he's like. Now, I don't know about you. You... you you, you here, my church family here, y'all so wonderful. But for me, to take me a sinner and make me look like the Savior, that's a great work. I don't know about you, brother. I don't know about you, brother Bill, brother Smokey. But me, to take me and make me look like Jesus, that's a great work. What about you? Now, watch what inspiration says. Time is what? Almost finished. Isn't that true in 2020? Now, notice the question. Do you what? Reflect the lovely image of Jesus 
as you should. So the closer we get to the end of time, it is a call that we should look like who? Jesus. How much like Jesus? Fully. Fully. Just like him, not just on Sabbath, not just once a year, but whether it's Christmas or Thanksgiving, every day of the week. Somebody said, well, praise the Lord, we have one day for Thanksgiving. No, 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 every day <laughs> is Thanksgiving to the Christian. Am I right? Amen. Now, it says, do you reflect the loving image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointed, where? Talk to me. To the earth. And saw that there would have to be a what? Now, why would we need to get ready on the earth? Because we're not ready. We don't look like him. Well, what does it mean to get ready? To look just like Jesus. It says... To get ready among those who have late braced the third angel's message. Said the angel, get ready. You remember that phrase? Yeah. Get ready. Here it is again. Get ready. You will have to die a greater death to the world than you have ever yet died. Now let's read this together. I saw. Now she's going to see two things. I saw that there was what? Number one, a great work to do for them. And but what? Little time in which to do it. That is the issue right now. And those who don't know what needs to be done are going to be passed by. God is trying to awaken the common people because the devil has control of the majority of our leadership today. Yes. Was it that way in the Jewish nation? Yes or no? Yes. Is that way today? Now I know you may get a little nervous about saying that. <laughs> this is going to cause some, this is going to cause some fire come, come down to you. But I'm going to tell you something. Anybody who stands for Jesus is going to have to go through it. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's going to be no secret rapture to take us out of here. Now, it says, I saw that there was a great work to do for them and but little time. So if you were writing on your paper, taking notes, and you should be, what two things would you put up there? Great work, little time. Just like that. Number one, great work. Number two, what? Question. I'm, I'm testing you now. What is the great work? To look just like Jesus. What is the little time? I'm going to suggest it to you today. I'm going to suggest it to you. The little time that we have, somebody says, well, we have the little time until Jesus comes. I'm going to say, no, 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 no. Someone says, well, we have until Michael stands up. I'm going to tell you today, no, 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 no. Not at seven day Adventist. I'm going to tell you, we have our limit until what? Talk to me. Now, I'm a, I'm a, I want you to, I, what, I, what I want you to do is write down on your paper, and we'll come back to it before we close. Write on your paper, the decree. Were you writing on your paper? The this is 1844. Now, we're talking about bell in the pomegranate, the decree. Bell in the pomegranate, the decree. Now, watch. Little time, I'm telling you, it's this National Sunday Law Decree. That's what I'm going to tell you. That's where it is. Now, what is the great work to do? I talk to me, somebody, to do what? Look. Just like Jesus. So the closer we get to the National Sunday Law, the more we should look how? Just like Jesus. That when the Sunday Law passes, at that point, we should be looking just like Jesus. Now, do we have to wait to the Sunday Law? No. You know that we can begin looking just like Jesus when? Right now. And that would be better. But there is a limit. In other words, you pay your bill. You can pay your bill early. Am I right? Right. There's no penalty. You can pay it as early as you want. But... But if you wait to, now, 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 Brother Bill, you need a microphone to preach this thing. <laughs> now, look, if, if, listen, if you can pay it early, you can look like Jesus as early as you want. That's going to be sweeter to you. But if you wait too late, we are in trouble in a time of trouble such as never was. Now, let's watch it. I saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble, must reflect the image of Jesus what? So great work, look just like Jesus. Fully like Jesus. Little time, national Sunday law. So then the question is, are we near in the Sunday law, yes or no? Yes. So then the question is, what does Jesus look like so that we can see if we look just like him? Is that a good question, yes or no? If we get the seal by looking just like Jesus, then what does the Bible tell me that Jesus looks like? Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Now the Bible is good, brothers and sisters. I don't know if it's just you, but it's th th just me. Th this thing is good. Is this good to you? Yeah. First Peter chapter 2. The Bible says, taste and see the Lord is good. Look at First Peter 2. And notice what the Bible says in First Peter chapter 2. And we want to notice something now, beginning in verse 21. First Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. Would you read that for us, Sister Debbie? First Peter 2, verse 21, please. Read it slowly for us, please. Is God calling us, yes or no? Yes. 
All right. Now stop. I want to stop in between. Please forgive me. But it says because Christ. Now we want to center our attention upon Jesus. Circle Christ. Because remember we must look just like Jesus. Focus on Christ. Focus on Jesus. Making him the center of our lives. Now let's watch Christ. It says you will call because Christ. Continue my sister. Leaving us a what? So Christ is our example. Question, what is an example? Is that something to look at and say, I can never be like that, but that's a good person to look at. Is that an example? No, what is an example? Something to pattern after. Something. In fact, the Bible goes on. It tells us what an example is. What does it say? Leaving us an example to do what? So an example is something for us to what? Follow. That's why we're called followers of Christ, disciples of Christ. So we should look like Jesus. Well, what does he look like? Next verse. Continue, my sister. Now read slowly. Read slowly. What does this next verse say? Continue. Now we're going to back up just to the first four words of verse 22. What does Jesus look like? Let's read it together. What? He did no sin. So if you're looking at Jesus, how does he look? He looks as one who does no sin because he didn't sin. Now, if I take a sinner, what would I have to do to a sinner to make him look just like Jesus? I must bring him to a place where no longer does he sin. Somebody says impossible. Well, if that's impossible, we will never look like Jesus. And remember, it's just telling us the same thing. What made man fall? What made man fall? Sin. What's going to make man stand? Sin. When we are no longer what? Sinning. Well, who stands? Those who get the seal. Well, who gets the seal? Those who look like Jesus. Well, what does Jesus not look like? He looks like someone who does not sin. It's saying the same thing in every direction. So my brothers and my sisters, then to look like Jesus, what did he look like? Jesus looked like this. He did what? So then what must happen to us in order to be made to look like Jesus? He must bring us to the place by his blood where we do what? No sin. Now how much is no? Zero. So then how much of sin? It's not full of sin. It is less of sin. What would you call a person who's been brought back to a place that they do no sin? What would you call that? Sinless. So then what is the great work that must happen before the sin law is passed? Talk to me somebody. To look like Jesus. Well, what does that look like? Sinless. To be a sinner brought to a sinless state. Now, let me tell you something. No other church teaches this. We're taught Jesus died on the cross. He saves everybody from his death on the cross. But not that that death has power. Not just to forgive sin. Oh, it does that. And praise God for it. Because if he couldn't forgive sin, nothing you did would matter anyway. <laughs> That's why revival, we, we, we need to come to him who can give us life before you can be changed into a sinless state. To be made sinless without Christ is nothing. But to be made sinless by Christ, revival and reformation, it does something to the character of God. It vindicates, it gives glory to God. Now, my brothers and sisters, look what it says. Signs of the Times, July 23rd, 1902, paragraph 14. Look what the prophet says. It says, let's read together. Everyone, not just some, but everyone who by faith, not by themselves, but by what? Faith obeys God's commandments. Let's read together. We'll reach the condition of what? Sinlessness in which Adam lived. How? Before his transgression. Now, that is the plan of redemption right there. That's the purpose of the sanctuary. That's the purpose of this entire message. Now, when this happens, this will cause Satan to tremble when he sees a generation in the church that are brought back to a sinless state. You know why? He knows they are now ready for the seal. That means that they're ready for the seal. Michael can do what? But guess what? Something happens in between the full sealing of the world and Michael standing up. Watch. We'll see something in a moment. Now look at this now. Somebody says, but victory over sin. How can I do that? And look at myself, I, I'm only human. Listen, if we're only human, we're not Christians. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's not just human. He's a new creature. All things are what? All, all things are passed away and all things become. Do you know in the new creature, humanity grabs hold of divinity. 
and the two work together. Look at ministry of healing, 180. This is one of my favorite quotations. Let's read this together. I'm getting, I'm getting excited. This is wonderful stuff. Watch what it says. The Savior did what? Took upon himself the infirmities of, what does infirmity mean? Weakness. weakness, sickness. He took upon us the weakness of humanity. So if we say we're weak, it's all right. Jesus is strong. It says, the Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a what type of life? Sinners. Did we prove that from the Bible? Yes or no? That men might have, what's the next two words? No. Do we have to be afraid of living a sinless life with Jesus Christ? No. no. That men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. Christ came. What for? To make us what? Partakers of the divine nature. We're going to go to the Bible. Sure, this is a Bible text. It says that Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature. And his life declares. Well, what does the life of Jesus declare? His life declares that humanity combined with what everybody? Divinity. Read that last line. Does not commit sin. It doesn't say will not. You know what it says? Does not. Do you know that if we are connected with Christ, we cannot sin? Someone says, are you sure? Let me go to the Bible and prove that. Go to 1 John. What book did I say? 1 John chapter 3. Now listen, with men, ourselves, this is impossible. But with God, how much? All things are possible. He says, look, my grace is what? Sufficient. That, 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 that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. I don't care how weak we are. If we connect with Jesus, there's hope. And 1 John chapter 3, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 4. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. We're going to read it slowly. Let's read it together. 1 John 3 verse 4. You're there, amen? amen. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 4? Whosoever committed sin, transgressive also. Why? For sin is the transgression of of the law. Now, if I transgress law, I sin. That's not going to make me stand. It's going to make me what? Fall. The transgressor shall fall. Verse 5. And you know that he was manifested. Who is the he? Who is the he? Jesus. Jesus. To, ma to take away our sins and in him is what? No. Now, look at verse 6. Now, if in Christ is no sin, if we're in Christ, then in us should be what? No sin. Look at verse 6. Verse, uh, Sister Davis, would you read verse 6, please? So if a man is abiding in Christ, what's going to happen? That's 1 John 3, 6. So if a man is abiding in Christ, he's not going to sin. So what does that tell me? If I'm sinning, what does that tell me? I'm not abiding in Christ. That's the secret. Now let's continue. Have not seen him. Why? Because by beholding him, we will be what? Changed. And if he's sinless, we behold him, it will change us into a sinless condition. So we have neither seen him or what else? Neither, neither what? Known him. What does that tell me? If I'm sinning, I don't know God. You know what our greatest problem is? We don't know him. To go through the time of trouble, we're going to have to know him like we have never known him before. We're going to have to know him in a close, intimate, and personal relationship. That friendship. Now, look at what this says. If we have sinned, we have, no, no, the, the apostle interrupts his teaching because by saying that, he knew he would shock the nation. And so in verse 6, he couldn't keep teaching. He had to stop for a moment and say, listen, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Uh, Amiah, verse 7. What does it say, please? So he stops telling him about victory over sin. He said, let, let, let me enter it right here because on this point, people are going to try to do what? Deceive you. He said, let no man, I don't care whether he's a pastor or a teacher or a member or a drunk. I don't care who he is. Let no man, <laughs> let no man what? Deceive you. I don't care who he is. Let no man deceive you. Continue. What does it say? Go on and say. He said, don't let a man tell you that he's sinning and somehow he's righteous. No, the man that's sinning, he's not righteous. He's a sinner. And the only way a sinner can be saved is by coming to Jesus. And when a man comes to Jesus, his life does not remain the same. He becomes a new creature. All things are passed away. The man that was drinking before Christ, he reaches Christ, boom, he wants to put down that alcohol. 
The man that was smoking before he met Christ, he reached Christ and all of a sudden, boom, he wants to stop smoking. His tongue that has been filthy with profanity. His eyes that have been looking at filth and dirtiness. His mind and manners that have been rough and un un unchristlike. You know what happens? He doesn't even know what he's doing, but he says, I want to be different. I want to change. I remember we were doing an evangelist meeting. We brought a, a, a woman down to this meeting and she was not a seven at Venice. She wasn't even going to church. She was hooked on different type of drugs, but she was coming to the meetings. And as she came one day, she came in. She had a pack of cigarettes in her, in, her, in, her, in her top pocket as she was coming to the evangelistic meeting. As she was coming in, she was coming. Nobody said anything because, you know, you can come to Jesus just as you are. Amen. God will take you step by step and make you just like himself so that you want to give up everything for Christ. You don't want to hold on to nothing. You say, Lord, whatever you want. And so that woman was coming. She was falling in. Uh, no, she don't fall in love. She was developing a loving relationship with Christ. And all of a sudden she walked into the meeting and she stopped. And she said this to me. She said, this pack of cigarettes, somehow I feel that I shouldn't have them here. Now, who told her that? No man told her that. The Holy, do you know the Holy Spirit will speak to you and say, you know what? What you're doing, you shouldn't be doing. Amen. That what you're eating, you shouldn't be eating that. You're listening, you shouldn't be. What you're watching, you, sh you can't watch. Jesus would not watch that. Can you imagine? Before you look at anything on television, you know what you should say? Can Jesus sit down and watch it with me? You know what you'll find out if you start knowing that? You might have to throw away your television. <laughs> that before you eat something, you find out would Jesus eat this right now? Before you wear something, find out what Jesus want me to wear. Before you say it. Because remember, the key is to look just like Jesus. Now, to me, that's a great change. I say, Lord, please help me. Even this morning, I'm pleading, dear God, I want to be like you. Do you know that we don't have much time left? I promise you, church, we don't have much time left. We're coming week by week. We cannot take this carelessly. I don't even know how much long we're going to be able to study like this. See, we're at the heart of the study. The devil doesn't want us to, he doesn't want us to get the rest of this. He will come with everything in his power to try to shut us down from studying this. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? We're going to sit down and take it and just say, you know what? Well, whatever you want me to study, I'll study that. If you want me to go to hell, I'll go to hell. I hope we don't say that. I hope that we'll say, look, whatever God, now respectfully, lovingly, but we cannot compromise. We've got to stay to the Bible and the Bible only. I'm not giving you my mind. Are we reading the Bible? Yes or no? Yes. Now, this is what must take place inside of us. Then he says, let no man deceive you. Verse 8, now he comes back to the subject in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Let's read it together. Verse 8. He that committeth what? Sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth when? From the beginning. Now notice, for this purpose, now this is God's purpose. The Son of God was what? Give me another name for manifested. Reveal. Why? That he might destroy the works of what? Well, what is the works of the devil? Talk to me. What is the work of the devil? Sin. Now look at verse 9. Now this is almost too good to be true. Let's read verse 9 together. This, I can't let you read this one by yourself. I got to read this with you. Verse 9 says, Whosoever is born of God, read it with me, doth not commit. Now what does that tell me if I'm sinning then? I have not been born again. Now watch. Let's continue. It says he doth not commit sin. Let's continue. For his seed, talking about the seed of Christ, that's going to bruise the head of the crush, the head of Satan. His seed remaineth where? In him. Now, this is too deep to study. We'll come back and study this a little, uh, a little deeper. But watch this now. If Christ is in us, what does the next line say? And he will not sin but once in a while. Wait, 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 wait. Let me make sure you got the, you reading your Bible. Is that what your Bible says? It says he not, will not. It doesn't say he'll sin once in a while. It doesn't even say does not like the prophet says. It says he what? Cannot. Cannot. So as long as Jesus is in our hearts, what does that tell me? I can't sin. So then what do I have to do if I want to sin? I have to put him out. Now the Laodicean church, which is God's church, last church, where is Jesus? You know why he's not inside the church? Because they're still in sin. And the only way to let Jesus in is to put sin and Satan out. Are you with me? Yes. Now, is it possible to live victor over, victorious over sin based on the Bible? Yes or no? Yes. How much sin? All. All sin. 
Now, if you study, you'll find out this is the message of the sanctuary. You remember we've been studying the sanctuary? We'll come back to this seal of God. I can't look at it right now. We'll come back and see what the seal of God really is in the mark of the beast. We found out sin living the possible. We found out it's the work of redemption under the symbol of the lamb and what else? The priest. Now, as a lamb, who is the lamb? Jesus. What did he do? He said, behold, the lamb of God that does what? Taketh away the sin of the world. Now, how much is he, he going to take away 99% of the sin and leave at 1%? How much of the sin is he going to take? So if he takes the sin, what does it leave us? Sinless. So now watch now. The lamb, what did the lamb do? The lamb caused us to be what? Now we studied this from the Bible many months ago. I'm not going through the verses. But what about the priest? Now the work of the lamb was that we must be bought, but the work of the priest is that we must be what? Brought. Brought, brought where? Back to perfection. Education 15. To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him what? Back to the perfection in which he was what? This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of what? So the object of life and redemption is to be brought back into the image of God, brought back to perfection. And my question is, what would destroy my perfection? When God made man, was man perfect, yes or no? Yes. Well, what destroyed man's perfection in the very beginning? What destroyed it? Sin. Sin. So then if I'm going to be brought back to perfection, what must God do to all sin in my life? He must do what? Take it away. From the books of record? Yes. From the heart? Yes. From the life? Yes. He must bring us back to his position. Now, do you understand? Review and Herald, September 25, 1900 says, He who does not abhor himself cannot understand. Cannot understand what? The meaning of redemption to be redeemed means to what cease from sin what does cease mean now i want to ask you a question does this mean anything to the day of atonement yes or no now watch it watch it this is the work of the priest now in the shadow in the sanctuary did god ever bring them back to perfection in the shadow did god ever bring the congregation Back to perfection in the shadow. Yes or no? Yes. When did God bring the congregation of Israel back to perfection in the shadow? On the day of atonement. On the day of atonement. Did he do it in the outer court? No. Did he do it in the holy place? No. Where did he do it? Most now he started in the outer court, but he didn't finish it. He continued in the holy place, but he didn't finish. But in the most holy place, the priest finishes the work. That what he started as a lamb, he finishes as a priest. He brings us back to sinless perfection, better than we were when he first created us. Now, why do I say better? Why do I say better than we was when he first created us? When Adam and Eve were first created, Adam, and Adam was perfect, wasn't he not? Yes. But did he sin? Yes. Did he fall? Yes. So when he was tested, he didn't pass the test. So God must do something more than bring us back to perfection and then let us fall again. He must bring us to a place where we would rather die than sin. That's better than we were when we were created. He's going to develop us. His intention was always to develop us. That was God's plan. But if you study the sanctuary in the type. Now, where would I go in the Bible? What book would I go into the Bible to show me in the type that in the very end of the Day of Atonement that the people of God were brought to a sinless state? Where would I go? Because see, this is, this is Seventh-day Adventism right here. This is Seventh-day Adventism right here. This is the message. Where would I go in the Bible to see that? Leviticus. Leviticus. What chapter? 16. Let's go there. Let's go to Leviticus 16. In Leviticus 16, in type, God did this. In the shadow, he did this. Now, why is that important? I mean, we want to find out in Leviticus 16 that God gets a sinless congregation in shadow, in type. And whatever he does in type, guess what? He's going to do in the anti-type. Now let's read this. Great Controversy 420. It says...